Power and Difference, a program that we have launched this year for the first time in, in here in UPF in the Department of Communication, and also a program that we, we are very proud of because it's a unique master in Spain and almost unique in, in the whole world, actually, where students have a chance to study and research issues regarding the construction, the representation and the recognition of difference and diversity through the lens of the most vulnerable groups. And when I say vulnerable groups, I mean vulnerable in a very expanded way, including humans, non-humans, poverty, gender issues, children, women issues, etc. The study of otherness, of diversity uh, through the optic of social communication is actually a top field in research uh, everywhere. And also the representation of otherness in media is a, a big challenge for professionals uh, currently everywhere as well. And therefore we are very proud to be able to contribute to this and to be able to, to put in the, into the world professionals and researchers who are ready to build a more, if you want, fair, inclusive and compassionate co communication and society. And to celebrate this first opening and this master and having all of you here, we have prepared a double session for this afternoon. First, as you know, we will have a lecture by one of our most international and renowned researchers at UPF, Dr. Paula Casal, who is ready there already. And second, we will, have, uh, we will show Unity, a documentary that is almost a premiere in Barcelona, almost, it has been only showed once in Barcelona last September, and which we think fits very well into the profile, the ethical profile and the inclusive approach of our program, because Unity as our program uh, addresses what truly means to be human in this planet. Uh, due to time constraint, mm, the, the speech, the power speech will be a little bit short in order to have 10-15 minutes at the end of the speech for questions or discussion or comments. And then we will move straight to the, screen, the screening. So if you have more comments or questions, you will have the opportunity to uh, raise them at the end of the session in the hall when everything is finished. So. It is my pleasure to introduce you, Dr. Paula Casal, and to give you a few uh, insights about her. Dr. Casal is a career research professor at the law department of UPF. She had previously taught at Reading University and at Killer University in the United Kingdom. She had uh, been a research fellow at Harvard University, at Université Catholique de Louvain, and also at Oxford University. Her work has appeared in many, many different important journals as Ethics, Economics and Philosophy, or Journal of Medical Ethics, Hypatia, Journal of Global Ethics, Journal of Moral Philosophy, Journal of Political Philosophy, Political Studies, Utilitas, etc. She is currently an associate editor of the journal Politics, Philosophy and Economics, and also the co-editor of Law, Ethics and Philosophy. She is also the president of the Great A Project in Spain, and also a board member of the academic NGO Academics Stand Against Poverty. She has, in short, one of the most outstanding and international research profiles on issues related to social justice, poverty, animal ethics, gender, interculturalism, bioethics, amongst others. And she has also a pretty busy agenda. So we really appreciate and feel honored to have her here with us this afternoon. She is going to speak about why persons have rights, a very interesting and, and intriguing topic. And so thank you very much for being here, Paula. Uh, thank you for inviting me, but uh, we don't see the... Ah, no, we don't. Okay. <laughs> so I had prepared material for a lot longer, but uh, I think it's not a good idea to give a talk and disappear without giving the people a chance to disagree or, or ask questions. So I'm going to try to go faster over the material, which means I will not be able to stop very much in some slides. But uh, I, I'm interested in um, you know, getting a sense of um, what you make of uh, my views. OK, so my plan is to spend maybe five minutes or so in distinguishing humans and other persons. Then um, to uh, explain why is it that most persons that are not humans are still mammals and whether there could be other persons that are 
not mammals, maybe not even animals. Um, then what follows uh, ethically from um, this discussion? For example, would they have um, rights as well? And um, consider some other um, ethical um, implications. Okay. Um, can you move over there, please, so that I can see your um, time signaling? <laughs> okay. okay, so first persons. We don't want to talk about uh, legal persons. We know I work in a law department. Of course, there are corporations that are persons and they are not uh, human and they have legal rights, but we are not talking about uh, persons in that sense. We're talking about uh, individuals with some uh, ethical standing. So um, they uh, have been discussed through the history of philosophy in this other non-legal sense. Initially, it was the uh, masks in the Roman, in the Greek theater that had the name persona because they represented characters or persons. So in English, you still say, um, uh, this is your public persona, you know, in that uh, Greek sense. Then they came to be employed to distinguish uh, persons and slaves. So to be a person was not to be a slave. Of course, I'm campaigning so that uh, the great apes are not uh, slaves, which is what they are. In the, sen in the case of other uh, entities, I would call them entities like robots that some people say are persons. Um, the, 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 the desirability is that they remain slaves and they, they don't uh, take over. No? There are some people like uh, Nick Bostrom who think that of course they would be non-human persons because all of us are going to stop being human because we will engineer ourselves to the point that we will stop being humans and become transhumans or uh, post-humans and still uh, remain persons, but he's also extremely worried about uh, robot persons taking over the world and coming to uh, dominate us, which is like the, the new version of the planet of the apes, no? the non-human pers non persons come to dominate us. Uh, you know, and all, all over the, the world there are cultures that talk about supernatural entities that, or uh, beings from outer space that uh, come to enslave um, human persons, and they are also persons, but not human. Okay, so the most um, um, widely used definition of uh, personhood is still the definition that Locke gave in uh, 1666. It was uh, published uh, three years later. And the idea is that you're a person if you are that uh, intelligent thinking being that has a uh, reason and reflection, and you can think of yourself as that thinking creature over time. So you were thinking about it yesterday, you will continue to think now, and you would be thinking in the future. So that, that continuity of uh, thinking and awareness of thinking is what uh, makes you um, a person. Okay, this is uh, Bonobo, for example, with the characteristic uh, hair um, with uh, center parting, and they are uh, persons. Now, the way uh, scientists uh, um, try to uh, measure or distinguish who is a person and who is not, the most common one is called the Gallup test or the mirror test. So the children, um, until they are um, one and a half, they normally fail the mirror test. So they, they paint, like in this case, uh, a black nose, and the boy you know, doesn't see anything weird when uh, encountering a, a mirror. Dogs, you know, they might leak or bark at the image without realizing it's them. While uh, the great apes, for example, or elephants, they uh, they would know this immediately, you know, like the um, orangutan there says, what is this blonde bit doing here? I'm, I'm a redhead, no? I've always been. <laughs> okay, so the test for being a person and for being a human is very different. No? You test something and if, if it has a DNA of homo sapiens, is a human. And if you can recognize yourself in a mirror or in a, in, a, in a TV camera, and you can think of yourself across time, then you are a person. In the case of um, the, um, <coughs> the, sorry, <coughs> the um, Holy Ghost and God and uh, Jesus Christ, for example, we have um, part of the theological tradition, this separation between the human and the person, where we have uh, three people, three persons, and only one of them was supposed to have uh, Homo sapiens DNA, no? the son, while the other ones uh, didn't have any DNA because they were um, 
uh, immaterial. And across the world, you have find the same pattern. No? There is one chief god in Egypt, uh, the sun, or in or in Greece, and the mates with a human. And then he has a son that is a hero and performs uh, great actions. And it's always this distinction between person and human uh, appearing in, uh, in religions. Okay, so that gives us uh, a separation of um, entities in two groups. No? On the one hand, we have um, non-human persons like angels, for example, or great apes, or made for some people, uh, robots. And on the other hand, we have um, humans that like Tutankhamun, is not a person because it's not thinking of itself in any way because it's dead, or people who are in an irreversible uh, comatose situation, or babies, or um, anencephalous uh, babies that are not persons now and they will never, um, they will never be. So one of the um, um, issues that this raises is that maybe the idea of um, human rights doesn't make very much sense because the fact that you have DNA of Homo sapiens is not related to what really matters uh, from the point of view of ethics, and it is not related to the idea of personhood. So at least you have to talk about human persons, and maybe some of the um, persons that are not human would have at least some rights as well, but we we'll talk about this later. So this is like the most extensive um, um, list of um, features of, uh, of personhood, is actually not about personhood, but uh, humanity. And uh, I've put in red the, um, the ones that uh, I am skeptical about uh, robots uh, satisfying, you know, such as you know, change or curiosity. Or, but some of them aren't really very important, like neocortical function. It doesn't matter where um, this is located. And in fact, we haven't studied all the birds, but it's quite likely that we would find more persons and it wouldn't be in the neocortex, it would be somewhere else that they locate the functions that we consider important. Okay, so let's um, see. Mammalian persons are most of the persons that have been tested and have been found to have definitely all of the long list, not just the log definition, but the long list of uh, features of personhood are mammals, right? They are um, elephants, uh, in Asia and Africa, and um, dolphins, um, orcas, and all all um, all of the great apes. No, so the bonobo, the gorilla, the chimpanzee, and the orangutan. And I found that there is a long list of features that all of these species have, even though they are quite different in some respects. And so I made a list of uh, all of these things, thinking that they they had to be related some in some way, because it was too much of a coincidence that all of the um, animals that have managed to pass the mirror test also have this long list of uh, characteristics, no? like they have pregnancies without twins, no? or having twins is, is a rarity. They're very long. They have lots of uh, neurons, um, mirror and spindle neurons. Um, they have a very prolonged lactation. They have interspecific altruism, so there are stories of them saving creatures of other species, including Thinking humans, they are very large. You know, they, why should pe people? You know, why should all persons be so large, and have a large brain? Not only because they are large, but proportionally very large, and they have cultural tool use, which means not only they use tools, but they use them because they learn from another creature using them. And they have death rituals, and they have language, and they have longevity. And I came to you know, think about all of this, how they could be related. And I think the key to, to all of this and to put the puzzle together is that um, they are all in the stream of the K reproduction. So, you know, in biology, the biologists classify species by the, whether they are more like R reproduction or K. So if they have lots and lots of offspring and they invest very little on it, or they have very few, but they invest uh, massively on, on them. So all of the persons, including humans, we are in, uh, in one stream, which is why, you know, <laughs> we have massive investment from the beginning, you know, like the elephant, you know, 22 months pregnancy, the orcas, you know, 18 months, the, all of them uh, take a long time. Then after that, there comes um, many years of, uh, of lactation. Um, I have, for example, this is the uh, years for, um, for um, the uh, great apes. Um, and uh, this, 
is not important in itself because, as you know, with human children, they can eat other stuff. No, they just continue to breastfeed so that you don't get pregnant because you have to teach the creatures so much and there's so much work that it's impossible to handle. No, an orangutan, you know, a single mom in the forest living 30 meters up in the canopy where the, the, the offspring can fall off and die, she's so busy that if she gets two, she just, you know, wouldn't be able to manage. So she needs to lactate like, for eight years so that she can manage to explain to the offspring all the 22 different types of tulios that orangutans have and uh, what are they supposed to eat, um, what is a good idea to eat when you have constipation or diarrhea or parasites and how to open certain things, what do you eat in different times of the year and so on. And so it takes a long time and you know in the case of dolphins that are also takes them quite a long time for the mothers to tell them how to use bubbles, how to use sponges, how to use uh, cells and other tools. In the case of orcas, how to regurgitate food in order to hunt. And, uh, and because it takes so long, they, they have to have this very prolonged um, um, childhood uh, with uh, mothers teaching them in, uh, in exercises. No? Um, here are some very well-known examples of, uh, of tool use, like uh, the termites. And, um, and the gorillas are the ones that uh, have been photographed less often using tools, and I think the explanation is likely to be the same reason why the females are using more of the tools. So uh, they have more nutritional needs because they have pregnancy, they have infants to feed, they have less restraint, they're smaller and with the smaller teeth, so um, the male gorilla will just go crack the nut and then the female will have to you know, be there with a, a stone smashing something. And also they are uh, not, um, fond of, uh, of killing in the same way. Not the chimpanzees would go in a group and, you know, kill a bonobo and then, or a bonobo, uh, sorry, a colobo monkey. And, uh, and then they would have a lot of protein and because the females uh, prefer not to, they, um, they will use termites or uh, get the protein in, um, in a different way. Okay. So she is measuring the depth of the rivers to know that uh, this is a safe area where the offspring can cross without, uh, without drowning because the great apes like humans can learn to swim but they don't, they're not natural swimmers. So she has to measure that. And so um, uh, the existence of all of these uh, um, neurons in the brain is related to both of these functions. On the one hand, in order to copy and imitate and learn culture, you need to have a lot of new mirror neurons, which is why all of these creatures have loads of uh, mirror neurons in their brain, and uh, also for empathy. No, so you need to understand what is wrong with this creature because you have so few of them that if one of them dies, it's a disaster for you. So you have to find out when they cry. Are they thirsty? Are they hungry? Are they tired? Are they, you know, babies are really very difficult to understand sometimes when they cry, and so it requires a lot of concentration uh, to try to put yourself in the position of the other and figure out what it is. Because if you get it wrong, you know, your baby might die. So it's very important, and you see them many hours concentrating, like in these photographs. And when Darwin saw that, he thought, well, this is the origin of morality. It is like this, by concentrating and putting yourself in the place of other and developing this empathy that we have begun to feel something for any creature that might not look like us, but you know, it still has like a big head and it wobbles and it, it, it walks in a way that it looks like it's gonna fall any moment and it's calling for mom. And this kind of behaviors already, you know, make us react in a protective or empathetic uh, manner towards it. So. It, that is probably why you see in all of these persons that invest so much in their own offspring, they're also behaving in an interspecific altruistic way. No? For example, you see elephants trying to get a rhinoceros out of a, a hole with the rhinoceros mother not understanding that the elephant is just trying to help and pushing it. There are lots of videos in YouTube you can see. And the rhinoceros mother keeps on, you know, uh, with the, with her own horn at the, at the belly of the elephant, and the elephant mother, uh, you know, reacts in the same way as if it was her own child, although it's a completely different species. But keeps on trying to um, to rescue the baby despite the baby's mom um, repeated attacks. No? So it is uh, in this way that we have evolved uh, morality, and that they have many forms of behavior that could be called, you know, if not moral, uh, at least uh, proto-moral. 
right? After this massive investment, when they die, then you see in all of these species a uh, reaction of uh, pain and distress. And uh, they need a lot of time sometimes to accept that the baby is dead, so they will carry it for some time, um, even though, uh, for example, chimpanzees don't like it at all. No? So if a mother uh, is carrying the corpse and in the heat of Africa, they become very dry, the corpses, when they they are in the group, if they accidentally get touched by a corpse, they go oh, and they jump uh, really scared because they don't like it. But they still tolerate the behavior, and the cetaceans uh, the same. When the mother feels that she has got to push the dead body of the baby for two weeks, the whole group slows down to accommodate this behavior of of the mother. And they also, apart from death rituals like elephants and gorillas, uh, um, practice uh, burying. They uh, have other practices of consolation and trying to distract uh, the mothers uh, from the pain. Or they would go like that orangutan who hates the water to rescue a, a, a baby because they understand that the mother will go crazy if the baby really drowns. And so in all of them, you see, um, they can relate to other species in an empathetic and compassionate way. This is uh, Copito. They are playing with the dog of... Uh, Sabater P and Coco with uh, the little cat she had, old ball, and Pankon was in this Japanese um, TV series and all of them. And of course, with uh, humans that um, are in many cases the, the favorite uh, playing companions of uh, some of the uh, great apes, maybe because they, they recognize the similarity, which in, in some cases is, m <laughs> is particularly clear. <laughs> so. Um, Okay, so what are the um, ethical implications? Well, uh, one thing is that maybe these uh, um, uh, patterns that we found we can use to try to locate other persons uh, in the animal world. No? For example, Mark Beko has recently written about uh, European magpies. And they are not very large, it's not very small, but not very large for a bird. There are other birds that are also very intelligent. Usually the, some of the large parrots are some, some of the most intelligent birds and they're also long leaves. So it pays off for them to learn something because they have you know, a, a, a long um, life ahead. They also have um, the European magpies. They also have uh, death rituals. They also put all the straws and, and sticks and things on the dead bodies. They also have um, um, brains that are different to other um, birds uh, in order to copy a uh, tool use, which are also tool users. So you see some of the, these patterns are uh, repeating. Now, in the case of uh, octopus, because they are invertebrates, is they're really very different. No? I mean, for a start, they have uh, 200,000 uh, eggs. No? So they are not the extreme case of, of any sort. But because they have um, uh, great intelligence in um, their capacity to, to hide, to use tools, to um, come out of labyrinths to open jars, for example. Uh, some animal legislation, like the UK, I think, was the first one to recognize it. They make them honorary vertebrates because they are really unusual for, for vertebrates, and, and there are now uh, recommendations. For example, they um, have um, the nerves, a very extensive nerve system to touch with the tentacles, but because in, in the sea there is no fire, no? we all the mammals, we have uh, these uh, uh, sensations because if we put our hand in something that is really hot, then it hurts and then we, we remove it and then we don't get burned. Or the same with frostbite. No? We don't want to uh, have frostbite, so it, it is painful if we touch uh, ice. That doesn't happen at sea and so the octopus uh, doesn't feel that, which is why the recommendation is to uh, freeze them, no? where th they just become unconscious uh, more gently. But um, in some countries, as a result of um, what we're learning now about the, them, they are, for example, banning this practice of eating them alive, w which is likely to be extremely painful for a creature that has all of these uh, sensors in, in all of the tentacles to be uh, chopped into pieces while still alive or eaten alive, as some people do. Now, <coughs> I am um, still not uh, very convinced by this uh, other campaign to make um, robots persons uh, with rights, but there are some philosophers like Helen Steiner who, who think that uh, if we uh, are serious about this idea that uh, 
uh, is not being a person, or maybe not or human, or maybe not even mammal, or maybe not even an animal that makes you a, a person, uh, why shouldn't the, um, the robots also be uh, considered? No? And he has this example of, of Hull in 2001 that I imagine you all know, decided that humans were not doing a very good job, and so he was going to take control of the um, spaceship and, uh, and, and you know, impose his own, uh, his own rules. And uh, Hilary Steiner thinks that, you know, maybe we should think about um, HAL as an uh, as entity that could have rights, given that he has acquired some form of self-consciousness and his own plans and, and ideas what to do. I, I think that this is like going farther in the direction that I wanted to go towards as a stream form of, um, of rationalism. And in fact, you know, one of my reactions when um, reading the, the book of the Great Day Project and seeing some of the experiments was um, that, yeah, it is really impressive that some of the things they do. No, I imagine you know this example with the computer. No, They have won the world champion of memory uh, and they do it very fast. No, The numbers appear and you have to touch them in ascending or descending order. They appear for only a fraction of a second, and then they are replaced by dots. And the chimpanzees, with no problem, they still do, 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 do. They touch them in the correct number. When the humans uh, try to do it, they get extremely stressed. <laughs> and with the biggest effort, some of the people who are very, very good at doing this, they fail. No? But why should this amazing ability to win at some computer games be connected to, um, to rights or to uh, your moral standing? No? Because, you know, of course, among humans, some people are very good with computers, others like me, not very good. And we don't think that, uh, you know, our um, interests are uh, different and therefore our rights uh, would be different depending on this, no? So it's a difference between saying that, um, uh, well, these animals really um, meet a threshold that means we should really take it seriously, the fact that they are persons, even though they don't have homo sapiens DNA, uh, as a sufficient condition for rights as well, not as a necessary condition. And another thing is to um, um, give so much weight to these uh, um, rational abilities as to uh, make it the only uh, criteria. No? Okay. So um, this thing, for example, about the three rights that um, the uh, uh, Great Day Project asked, no? or you know, most animal uh, movements are required, no? so that they don't get killed. They, uh, they, um, they are not uh, imprisoned arbitrarily and they uh, can live uh, without torture. In the case of uh, Spain, there was the, the, this addition because there's a difference between torture, which is uh, causing pain in order to extract information, and sheer mal maltreatment, which is what, uh, what is more uh, common in Spain. And slavery, because that's also most, uh, just as common as, uh, as imprisonment when you force them to, uh, to perform. And, uh, and and the trade, you no know, trading them with with um, zoos so for breeding programs and separating them from all their loved ones so that you can, you know, mix these genes uh, with with the other ones. And of course, there's this issue of uh, extension, which is not at all a concern in the case of robots. No, I think nobody is very sorry that we have lost uh, World Star or these very primitive programs that that we have earlier on. All the computer languages we no longer use is good that we don't have to to deal with them and we are not uh, concerned. But what are the, um, the reasons why we are asking for uh, these three rights and, and not others, and how do they connect to the features of, of personhood? Let's start with the issue of death. You can see in this picture, which I, I think is very interesting because these people have gone through a war, they are military people, and yet you can see it in their faces and in their body posture that they recognize that something quite horrible has happened there when all of these uh, gorillas have, have been killed. So why, why do we think it's uh, so bad about, um, about death? How, how am I doing? Yeah, I'm on. Okay. Um, so imagine, you know, maybe you don't want to imagine that you, you die, but imagine that some, somebody dies. Uh, as I can see, you're all very young. You have um, a long life ahead of you. So that's the first thing that is uh, uh, bad about dying, that you lose all your life that you have ahead of you. So that, of course, uh, goes for all animals. 
And it would also go for embryos. No? In fact, some people would say, well, if this is the criteria, then a very early embryo has a greater expect, you know, life expectancy than anyone, so it would be worse to kill that um, creature than, than to um, kill a child that is already at school, for example. And so that can't be the only, the only criteria. That was um, uh, Thomas Nagel's uh, paper uh, on death. Uh, was a good start, but of course it can't be the um, the only criteria that that we employ. So the most obvious second one that comes to mind is that of course when, if you die, there would be people who would be devastated. In fact, maybe it's even worse for the parents to to lose a, a son than it is for the son to to die. But that can't be the only criteria because you know the death of orphans is uh, also very very tragic. So. Um, Jeff McMahon and some other uh, philosophers, uh, one of them as Ezekiel Pyle sitting here on the first row, <laughs> emphasized the uh, uh, third factor, which is the connection with yourself, right? So if you are already a child, you're already at the school, you're already planning to be a policeman or a, or a doctor, you have a connection with your future that in humans becomes to be so intimate and so intense that it comes to a point that almost everything we do, we do with some plan for the future, not for the present, where other animals, they don't have a future in the sense that they can't think of the future and they can't act for that. They live, they live the moment. No? While um, we have this very intimate and intense relationship with other human beings, but also with ourselves in the future, it is for this future self that, that we do lots of things and, and we plan and we think ahead. So when you kill creatures that have this um, forward-looking uh, imagination, and they have a sense of self which is connected to this future self, then you sever this, uh, this connection in a way that makes it more tragic than when you um, kill other animals that maybe you shouldn't kill anyway. But, uh, but it's harder to explain. For example, it's harder to explain why is it better that you have um, a fish that lives uh, 20 years than two fishes that live um, 10 years each. No? If uh, the, the fish is not connected to his f the future fish that he will become more than he is connected to a different fish, so, so they are in co completely unconnected, then why is it uh, better that there is only one fish living 20 years rather than two? The fish has no idea that it is the same fish. It would not be able to tell if it's the same fish that was there in that pond last summer. So if there's no that uh, mental connection, why would it be better from the point of view of ethics that it is the same, the same fish uh, all along? While in the case of um, persons that have this ability of thinking about themselves and having this mental continuity, then you can explain that, of course, it, it matters that you are the same person that lives all of the years that you are supposed to live as a homo sapiens or a chimpanzee, etc., because you have that connection that would be severed if, uh, if you got killed. Okay. Um, let's see. The badness of, uh, of imprisonment. And you know, I'm talking about um, um, I'm talking about rights, but um, I don't want to make a lot out of the idea of that we must talk about rights and have a particular view of rights. You know, if people want to say, you know, let's talk about duties and let's just admit that these things are very important and we understand the reasons why it's terrible to do certain things to certain creatures, then um, I'm happy about that. I won't argue in, you know, that we must use the word uh, the word right. So in the case of uh, imprisonment, what makes uh, it particularly bad, or bad for others as well, but particularly bad for, for persons, is first that you have this brain that is being designed to acquire information about tool use and about lots of things. That's why the mothers need all this time to give you the information. And when you are in prison, you are so bored because your brain is designed to process information and get new information all the time. And so imprisonment is really bad. You know, in, fa in fact, uh, solitary confinement is uh, one of the things that are more feared in, uh, in prisons, you know, for the boredom as well as for the loneliness. You, know, you don't have your loved ones, and in some cases you don't have anyone. And if you are a very intensely social creature, you know, like most persons tend to be very, very social animals, then it makes it uh, worse. In fact, you have a sense of time, means, you know, I've been here for all this time, when is this going to end? That makes it uh, worse and prolongs uh, 
the suffering and the fact that you can imagine yourself somewhere else. So if a mad scientist kidnap you to for, to for some crazy experiment, you'd be there in that cage thinking, I was there in Poblet, no, having a really good life, and you know, what am I doing here? If you can think about yourself in a different situation, then you have um, a sense of indignation and frustration that you don't have if you can only live the present and you have no capacity of thinking of yourself in a different case. Now, if you cannot tell whether the pond you are is the pond in which you are or the, the pond in which you are in prison, if you can't tell the difference, then you know there's some um, you know some people like um, uh, Cochrane has uh, uh, written this book about animals without liberation. It maybe it is inappropriate to talk about liberation in some species where there is no this sense of I could be elsewhere and therefore they don't have the uh, requisite mental capacity to understand freedom or to be indignant about uh, having their, their freedom uh, removed. In, uh, the case, in their case, they are very indignant. In fact, one of the ways in which scientists have uh, the, tested their capacity to plan for the future is because there are some chimpanzees are so annoyed about being in prison and so annoyed about being constantly observed by people coming and have no private life because these people are looking at you at everything you do all the time that some of them accumulate uh, projectiles like stones or poo in uh, certain locations knowing that in the weekend the visitors are going to come to the zoo so that they can have this stock of, uh, of projectiles that they can then uh, uh, throw to the people and because they accum accumulate them in you know foresight of uh, the, the visitors arriving they're measuring how, how much can they uh, predict the arrival and accumulate the, uh, the stones uh, in advance uh, for that uh, purpose. And the last one is the pain. Now, I was um, talking to, um, to Katya and Ezekiel earlier about this debate. Uh, obviously, this, there are some ways in which uh, uh, torturing persons is worse because they will um, become tortured people. You know, if somebody tortures you, it's not just the pain that you feel at that moment, it's that you will become a tortured person. We have this long-term emotional memory which is different to remembering where you have hidden some nut or something. It is a memory that allows you to remember not just what, ha what happened, but you reproduce the emotional states of you know, that argument you had, and then you not only remember the argument, but you remember how you felt during that argument. No? So uh, these people who have, all of these persons have emotional memory, lo in the long-term emotional memory, they would be suffering in the, you know, more because of that. But of course there would be other capacities uh, that allow you to understand uh, things better and would diminish the, um, the pain. No, for example, I imagine none of you cries when you get lost in the supermarket or if the lights go off, as children do, because sometimes lacking capacities you know, just makes you panic and fear for something that is nothing to another one with uh, um, greater capacities. But uh, they can also, in other cases, as in the case of torture, they can also increase uh, the pain that it causes them. You can start worrying whether your family or your loved ones are undergoing the same torture that you are that you're suffering. And all of that makes it uh, much worse. Okay, so I just have some very quick questions and finish. Okay. So, um, uh, robots play, I imagine many of you play with, with your robot uh, chess or other things, but they don't enjoy playing, and I think the, this is more important than the ability to play. You know, all the great days, for example, learn this idea of you have some rules that you have to respect, and then you play, and it's more fun. But uh, they is the enjoyment of the game rather than you know being able to win every time that um, makes a difference because it means you can have um, your life can go better or worse. No, the same with. Uh, uh, painting. No? Many people tell me, oh, yes, I've seen these paintings made by chimpanzees, but some of them are not very good. And I say, well, yeah, of course, you know, they're like two or three year olds, you're not very good. But what is really amazing is that they want to paint them, that sometimes the, the sort of monopoly money that they get paid in, by the experimenters for doing the experiment, they prefer to use in paint that any rather than in uh, fast food, no? and that they want to finish the painting, or that they say, I want to put that red stuff in there. Elephants can paint very well. No? They get trained, and they are very good at tracing, so elephants do paint beautiful uh, paintings. But the main thing is, you know, who do they want to do it? Because I'm sure computers will make lots of paintings in the future, but I don't think they will. 
Uh, the same with help. Now they are de developing all these new computer helpers. We have a helper in the computer, and now they are developing these robots that will go into burning buildings and will rescue individuals. They will rescue individuals because they will be programmed to rescue individuals, but they wouldn't have this empathy and this desire to help the other that, that we see in these other animal persons. And of course, you know, the, uh, we were talking about this earlier. How do you uh, um, check in the, the Turing test? No, the, this test uh, to see if you're talking to a, a robot or to a person. It's very easy to uh, tell it is a robot by telling a joke or anything ironic because they can't get it, no? So uh, this, all of these things are not um, uh, ideas that somebody who is very concerned with just the rational uh, capacities like Hill Steiner would focus on, but they are essential for making your life going better or worse. And so they are essential for, you know, what we discuss uh, in ethics. So I think, you know, they should be given just as much uh, um, importance as this, you know, ability to beat a, a computer or to beat a, a human being at, at some task. And I finish. Okay. Do we have time? Do we have time for some questions? Ah. Well, if you have any question, we have five, ten minutes for questions. And we have also a microphone if you want to use it. Well, it has been a very different lecture from the ones we are used to have here in this auditorium talking about persons without almost a single picture about humans, just <laughs> two children. But seeing that we share many different issues and that personhood may be valued for many different things that we can see in ourselves. No questions? Well then, I don't know if you want to add something or Paula? Um, as a matter of closing I for, for your recommendation. It is the first time it happens to me, and normally I get so many questions that I thought, oh no, I, I, I must hurry up to... Uh, uh, well, I could respond on uh, any topic that people uh, wanted. It doesn't have to be a question, it could be a comment, or I have, in fact, brought lots of other s slides in case the topics uh, came up. You know, I can talk about... Um, you know, the kind of um, ethics that they have, for example, or other, um, you know, cognitive abilities, or, I mean, anything that you find it interesting. I went to um, Art Santa Monica last week for a debate on artificial intelligence, and of course there were lots of engineers, and more than on the ethics uh, aspects, they were interested in comparing um, animal intelligence and computer intelligence. So you never know where what the audience uh, wants to hear, but. So, yeah, yeah. Sí? Oh. Yeah, you, you were talking about the big uh, mammals, uh, but what about the other animals, like chicken, we have huge chicken farms, or, or this kind of animals, cows. Um, have you, uh, what is the, the current uh, idea of the rights of these kind of animals? That maybe don't, don't fulfill all these requirements to be able to, to yeah, have yeah. this person, no, abilities. Yeah, yeah. Right? Th that's why I said that um, they um, were, uh, we were talking about the sufficient conditions, no? that if you are a person and you have this capacity to suffer and this capacity to imagine yourself elsewhere, etc., that makes it sufficiently bad to kill you or imprison you, that you know, there are reasons to have... Um, a right or some form of uh, protection so that this doesn't happen to you. But of course, that's not uh, uh, necessary. No, that's just uh, sufficient. And uh, in the case of, uh, of pain, I emphasize that you know, the, the uh, lower capacities can in fact increase uh, pain sometimes because there are, there are people um, who are now uh, using this to defend um, a new uh, well, it's not a, a new version of speciesism, but we have been discussing speciesism for many years, and, and now it seems that more people are saying, no, I'm not a speciesist, but I am a personist. I am okay with the rights for persons, but the ones that are not persons, uh, I don't um, want to consider them. And I really um, 
don't see the uh, the argument for it, even though some extremely good philosophers like like um, Shelley Kagan have been um, defending uh, this view. If the pain is of the same intensity, of the same duration, and of the same type, because it happens in the life of a person or a non-person, I don't see the difference. I, I used to have this neighbor who had a dog and always used the dog to keep the elevator door open. So it's, I know it's very unpleasant to have the elevator door you know, closing on you, but it's very unpleasant for the dog. So the fact that the dog is not a person, if it is just as unpleasant and, and they don't like it, why use the dog rather than, than yourself? I think you know, that in case of pain, you, know, they, you have to focus on the type of suffering, the intensity and the duration and whether there are side effects, but you can't say that because it's part of the life of a person immediately acquires greater moral significance. I don't see the argument for that. So I think we have another question up there. Um, I'm not sure um, really uh, which ones uh, conclusions are you trying to show with this conference. I I don't understand. Sorry. <laughs> what which ones are the conclusions of this conference? The conclusions are that there are well many conclusions. One that there are persons that are not human. That some of the reasons we have in to give rights or strong moral protection to humans uh, also apply to other creatures that exhibit the same features even though they don't have homo sapiens DNA. And I tried to explain why is there is this connection, you know, what is the connection between being able to imagine yourself elsewhere and the badness of imprisonment, for example, because otherwise we would just be giving lists of uh, capacities and then coming up with a list of rights, whether it's human rights or animal rights, that are disconnected. You know, they want the first list impresses you and the other one, okay, but there's no explanation of how they do uh, relate to each other. No? There's also uh, the issue of uh, the difference between killing and, uh, and suffering because there is a, a big asymmetry that puts many people off. No? So when they say, oh, if I, if I agree that uh, causing animal suffering uh, is bad, then I must be committed to uh, never uh, accepting the death of, of an animal. But once you understand uh, in more detail what makes it bad to die, then you can see why in some cases we say you know, priority for suffering and priority in respect to death are not the same. That is, for example, what happens in pregnancy. No? The mothers will go through any amount of pain in order to save the, the, the fetus, even a very, very small pain. But when you have to choose between the life of the mother and the life of the fetus, you save the life of the mother because these two things are different. You have a different explanation for both of them. The same happens in, uh, in lots of uh, movies. You know, there are lots of movies that have this as a plot, you know, that there's a soldier that has lost the legs and is going mental, and you know, then all of the other marines that are healthy and strong bear the pain you know, without any painkiller or whiskey, and they give it all to this guy. And when there's not enough room in the helicopter, and they you know, have to be rescued, or somebody has to stay behind to detonate the bomb, it is always this guy who has less to, less to lose when he loses his life because he's already gone crazy and lost his legs and you know, he's alone and so on, that volunteers to be the one that sacrifices. So the issue of pain and the issue of death are very different ones. So when people try sometimes discuss um, this, these matters as if you know, the, whatever, um, applies in one case, applies in the other one, and then they think, oh, well, then I don't agree with the conclusion. They have to think about it more carefully. I mean, what is it that makes it bad the, that you kill this creature? And what is it that makes it bad to cause pain to the creature? And then you, you understand why there are this uh, symmetry between uh, killing and causing suffering, for example. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Paula. We have to move on to the screening. I think it has been a very stimulating talk about a different way of thinking about our usually very narrow way and vision towards what persons mean, and including this view from someone who has worked a lot 
with great apes and it's an expert on great, great apes is something illustrating at least I think because she has a lot of experience and has given to us a lot of examples who at least for me were rather new some of them so well thanks thank you very much and and thank you all of you for your questions and being here so thank you, thank you.